Welcome back everybody. Here we go. Another weekend. More adventure. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen to another stick shift. Just want to give you guys a big thank you first of all because I've seen the comments and I've seen all the incredible questions that are coming through. So big big thank you to you. I'm thrilled that you guys are so enthusiastic about aviation and aircraft maintenance. And you've been asking for me to get more technical because you kind of enjoy the technical mumbo jumbo. So I will try to do my best on this video to give you more information and more data. So buckle up, let's have some fun. Let's go clock in and see what the day brings. First office of the day, beautiful 37, 800. All is good. I can still not get used to the paint job over there. <laughs> So in recent years, they decided to start painting the winglets and the sharklets on the aircraft. It was kind of funny because it was slightly offset or it just didn't look right. You'd have to kind of twist your head sideways and kind of go, I think that looks right. But it's funny. Uh, it grew on me. I like it. On the wing, on the sharklet. Yeah, it's fine. It's growing on me. Looking good, looking good. Okay, first item on the list is this little probe that you see. This is a CFM56-5B engine. It's equipped on the 737-800 or the NG series. The probe in question is called the T12 sensor. This measures inlet temperature. It collects this data and sends it to the EEC, the electronic engine control. It also acts as a standby or an alternate total air temperature data for the Adaroos, which is the navigation system. But that's not all. It also collects data for the engine thrust management systems. The EEC will collect this data and will send it also to the variable bleed valves as well as the VSVs, the variable stator valves. This is also important because of fuel management. It has a dual channel system, channel A and channel B, and placed in one probe. And the probe itself is actually made out of platinum. Pretty cool, right? It's a small little component, but it does a very important job. Another common question I get is what is that fin on top of the engine? The technical name for this is a vortex control device, but it's generally known as a strake. When you have massive engines like this hanging underneath the wing, it starts obstructing airflow over the wing. The vortex control device basically smooths out the airflow around the wing. If you have ever flown, you might have seen this little effect right here. You see it? How the air is flowing over the wing? That's the strake doing its job. There you go. Overall, it's just there for better aerodynamics. There you go, there's your air to ground sensors. This is what you call a proximity switch. Let's the aircraft know when the gear is up or down. Main landing gear on a 737 actually has eight separate sensors, four for gear up and gear down, and four for up lock and down lock. All this data gets fed into the PSEU, proximity switch electronic unit. The 737 is a very interesting creature. It's very simple, but at the same time, it's very complex. I know this looks overwhelming, but in my brain, it all makes sense. Yeah, I'm crazy. <laughs> As we keep moving forward, we're gonna take a look at the outboard leading edge of the wing. I want you to focus your attention on the leading edge, especially where the holes are. Those holes serve a very particular purpose. The leading edge has a particular system called the wing thermal anti-ice system. It takes hot air from the pneumatic systems and pumps it into the leading edge. This prevents ice buildup. There is ducting that goes all across the leading edge of the wing, but as soon as the slack gets dropped, there is this little component called the telescopic duct. This will extend and allow bleed air to push into the slats. Now that the icing issue is solved, you can't keep pushing hot air into a control surface like that. You'll damage it. Hence why you have those holes. It basically exhausts the hot air. I told you I was going to make this a lot more technical this time around. Let's just hope you're not bored to death at the end of this video. If you've ever paid attention to the leading edge of the 737, you'll also notice these tabs. These things are called Vortilons. They are fixed aerodynamic devices. Their primary purpose is to improve handling at low speeds, especially for the ailerons. When aircraft speed is reduced and the aircraft approaches stall, 
the local flow at the leading edge is diverted outwards. These little tabs will redirect the airflow, which will energize the boundary layer. It basically keeps the air smoothly flowing across the wing. Oh look at that, that's picture perfect right there. That's a screensaver. Very pretty. It's like a rerun from last week. <laughs> I had to come back here and fuel the vehicle again, but yeah. Guess what? I don't know if you probably guys heard the news. The Max 9's back in service. Apparently they're gonna start flying them uh, starting this weekend. Yep, that's it. The Max 9 is back into service, if you guys didn't know about it. They solved the door plug issue. While I was fueling the vehicle, I noticed the United Mechanics running the engine on the 757. They're doing a high power run. Let's enjoy this. Nothing but pure power! This is a 757-200 and it's equipped with a Rolls-Royce RB211. There's a reason I call the 757 the Ferrari of the sky. This thing is a powerhouse. I've worked on 757 many years ago and I tell you what, it's probably one of my favorite airplanes. Doing high power runs on these airplanes is so much fun, but it's also scary as heck. I have this thing at about 80% power, it is shaking itself to pieces. You feel like your eyeballs are about to pop out of your head. Same time that you're running that engine, you're trying to look at the parameters. Sometimes it shakes so bad you can't even read the parameters. That's why there's a, a little button called event. It basically takes a little snapshot of what's going on. 757 mechanics will know this. Had to come down here. That's right. Cargo never disappoints. And it never does. And it never will. Just wow. I Just wow. What is this? This looks like a spaceship. This is the one of the most unique cars I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Look at this. Incredible. All right, go ahead. You guys are the experts. You tell me what this is, because I have no clue. Looks like it's all carbon fiber body, that's for sure. That's nuts. This is absolutely incredible. Wow. I think this is the Ferrari from last week. Yeah, I think this is the Ferrari from last week. Huh, interesting. Still here. Still looks pretty. But next to it, I don't know what this is. Y'all know what this is? Hmm, interesting. Got a interesting paint job on it, that's for sure. Looks like a Lexus. That's what it looks like to me. It's gotta be modified somehow. Cool. Anyway, that's about it. But that first one, man, that was cool. On the way back, I managed to catch a couple of beautiful airplanes taking off and landing and this beautiful private jet taxiing along. Now, I don't know much about corporate aviation or corporate jets, but one thing I do know, they like to use their thrust reversers a lot to slow down. This saves their brakes. It's always fun to see one of their clamshells closed up like that. It's pretty fun. I think the only way they can get away with this is because the engine is so up high off the ground. Okay, 
Look who's in town. Somebody important. Air Force 2. That is the cleanest 757 you will ever see. And to my surprise, another treat out here in LAX. Air Force 2 was in town. That is one of the cleanest 757s you'll ever see. Unfortunately, I didn't catch it taking off or landing, but I did get to drive by it and check it out. Not only was the 757 there, which usually carries the vice president, you also had the 737. I believe they carry the generals or their general, you know, their staff. That's as far as I know, but still pretty nice to see a beautiful, clean 737 right here. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe this is a Dash 300, and I think the military calls this the C-40. After all said and done, on our way back, also managed to catch uh, beautiful 747-8 from Lufthansa. Never a dull moment when you're in LAX. There's always something beautiful to see. You know, I want to share something with you, uh, some thoughts of mine that I had the other day. You know why we love aviation so much? Or I guess why I love aviation so much? It's because it's unbiased. We as people make it biased because we form our own opinions. But in its purest form, aviation is one of the most unbiased things in the world. It doesn't care what color you are. It doesn't care what gender you are. It doesn't care what religion you come from. It could care less about your political stance. Aviation simply exists just for everybody. This is what makes it so beautiful. And this is why everybody can be a part of it. It's a unifying factor, a big, beautiful umbrella where everybody can come together and just enjoy one thing all together. Simply airplanes. Well, this bird came in clean, but a good habit of mine is to always print out a post flight report. Let me put some context behind what I'm showing here. This is an Airbus, and Airbus systems are very peculiar in how they work and how they represent information. The aircraft is incredibly smart in a factor where it does not need to give the pilot unnecessary information. The aircraft monitors pretty much every single aspect of every system. It monitors every sorts of phase as well, phases of flight. Everything from power on to power off, it records everything. The thing we have in question here is an HF2 fault. And here's the interesting part about this. This fault was not even generated. It was a background fault. This occurs usually during transition of power. It occurred around phase two, which is engine startup. This is when engines usually take over the power generation system. It comes off of the auxiliary power unit generation and goes on to the engine generators. A slight interrupt in the system might cause a slight fault like this, but it's very insignificant because the system itself reboots, or I should say talks to itself once again and corrects it. The aircraft is very self-sustaining. There was a loopback crosstalk fault generated, and this is because the HF system, the high frequency radio system, was trying to talk at the same time with HF1 and HF2. The pilots could not even document this because it was insignificant. They didn't even see it. But I pull up a post-flight report on this aircraft, and just me being inquisitive, I do a bite check on it. Built-in test equipment. And as I suspected, no faults. Tested okay. You guys have to remember, majority of these modern aircraft are literally flying computers. And these systems have multiple redundancies within them. The systems talks to itself. It talks to each other regarding to other systems. It always records everything. What I'm showing here is just basic troubleshooting tactics. Now the code that you see there, the alphanumeric codes that you see there, those are very complex. I don't even understand what that means. If there was an actual fault or significant malfunction, these are the codes that will point me in the right direction. Next office. Uh, this one just came in from Dallas. It's going to go right back out to Dallas. I did the walk around. Let's go big tour. Let's go be tourists. Just look around. There you go. A little bit of peek of the wheel well. The 
Some more proximity sensors right there. Nice healthy tires. That's the pack intake. Best stuff. You guys know about this, right? So this is a main landing gear strut assembly on an Airbus 321 and the thing I'm pointing to right there is a very interesting thing. It's called a spare seal activating valve. There are various amount of seals that are within the strut. The seals are the barrier that keep the fluid and the pressure which is nitrogen in between the strut. Now time to time these seals do get deteriorated. If there was such an event or there was a leak we can alternate and go into the spare seal simply by turning that valve stem. It will engage the secondary seal and afterwards the aircraft will be scheduled for repair to make sure that the primary seal is being corrected and repaired. Isn't redundancy beautiful? Well, this is the last one for the night. Yeah, it was a pretty un uneventful day, huh? That's all right, but we did get to see a pretty cool car. Anyway, I'll see you guys here bright and early in the morning. Day one completed, let's go on to the next one. Good morning everybody, let's go. Start this day out right, start the beautiful 777. Gorgeous, it's gonna be a beautiful day. The morning schedule is usually pretty hectic. I didn't even get a chance to show you guys on the interior of this one. Just got a chance to watch it roll out and she was a beauty. This is what I call taking my airplane out for a walk. <laughs> uh. On to the next one. Another triple seven. Do a quick little walk around. This one actually came up from the hangar. So we just gotta make sure everything's okay. It's always fun to walk down the line of the belly. There you go, it's also getting fueled, or about to get fueled. This is a Dash 200. I can't remember who asked me, but somebody asked me to do an overview on antennas of aircraft. Let's go. This is going to be a lot. We're going to use this 777-200 as an example. And the first thing we're going to notice is the radome. This is the tip of the nose. Behind that radome, you're going to have various amount of antennas. One is going to be your weather radar antenna. Second is going to be your glide slope. And the thirdly, you're going to have your localizer. Obviously, weather antenna is for tracking weather and localizer and glide slope is for landing. It basically helps the pilots land and identify runways in the right path they're going onto. Here's a quick example of a 737 and uh, what it looks like underneath the radome. And here's another example of a 787, what it looks like underneath there. Forgive me for going very quick about this, but there's a lot of information there, so I cannot unfold it all, all at once. So let's keep on going. Moving on to the 777 once again, the 200, and we see this little unit. Yeah, that's actually an antenna on the gear door, believe it or not. This is actually part of the glide slope system that's within the radome, but this is an additional glide slope. This is called the glide slope track antenna. The 777 is a very tall aircraft, and the primary glide slope system obviously is housed within the radome, but this is a secondary factor in this. The track antenna is positioned to minimize the vertical distance between the antenna 
flight path, and the main landing gear. This compensates for the height of the aircraft. Because the aircraft is so tall, it needs to understand and get proper measurements between the ray dome and the nose gear and when the aircraft will touch down. Aircraft such as the MD-11 as well as the A380 also have the system. Up next is this little yellow antenna. You're going to see a variety of these things. This particular one is an ATC antenna, air traffic control. You're going to see a redundancy on top and bottom of the fuselage because there's multiple antennas for the same system. Up next, you're going to see this little square thing. This is the TCAS antenna, traffic collision avoidance system. This one keeps the airplanes from running into each other in the sky. The square ones that you're seeing there that say do not paint, those are the radio altimeters. These things send out signals down to the ground to let the aircraft know how high they are off the ground. There's a set that transmits data and there's a set that receives data. So that's why you have so many. Pretty much all aircraft have these. Up next, you're going to see another yellow antenna. This is called the DME, Distance Measuring Equipment. This is used by the aircraft navigation systems to determine the aircraft's slant range. Once again, used for landing. Up next, you got a marker beacon antenna, which transmits and emits a unique pattern to provide aircraft positional information. It gives the aircraft a position along where it can establish a route to their destination, such as a runway. Right behind it, you have another redundancy, another DME antenna, distance measuring equipment. And further on back, we got more antennas. The big fin that you see there that looks like a big candy cane, that is your VHF right antenna. Very high frequency radio antenna. This is used for communication basis. There's two more on top. Vertical stabilizer also has us two antennas, the HF antenna as well as the VOR. They are embedded into the structure itself. HF standing for high frequency and VOR very high frequency omnidirectional range. Now let's take a look at the top of the aircraft. Right at front you're going to see the same things. First one the TCAS right there the square one. Right after that another ATC antenna. Right after that the GPS antenna left and right. I think GPS is pretty much self-explanatory. The fin that you see right after that is the VHF left antenna. Oh, before I forget, the big fat dome that you see right there, that is your Wi-Fi antenna. That's how you go on the internet on the airplane. Ones after that is the ADF, automatic direction finder. After that, you're going to see your SATCOM antenna right there, the big square one. That you're going to see your VHFC, the center. As you can see, the aircraft is littered with communication devices all over the place. It's quite incredible. If you're still here and you're listening to all the technical mumbo jumbo, I appreciate you. I know it can get very boring really quick. On to the next office. Time to shut that down. All right, now somebody's gonna say right here, this is a leak. Nope, that's not a leak. <laughs> that's actually glycol. That's the icing fluid. That's what that is. It smells like it too. But yeah, that's just basically glycol. Usually a residue ends up on on the aircraft, and then when it comes down from altitude, it Starts dripping all over the place and it looks like a leak, but it really is not a leak. Just the icing fluid. The component we're looking at right there is the tail skid. This is equipped on various amount of aircraft. It basically is a protection device for an aircraft when it over rotates. Prevents further damage to the empennage. Well, we're back at International. Next office. Let's go see how she's doing. Oh man, look at this. They got a brand new takeoff flight. This is the new cluster. This is nice. Look at that, that is pretty. The latest and greatest of LED technology aircraft are being consistently upgraded. 
Matter of fact, the latest generation of Airbus that are being developed, all these takeoff flights, turnoff flights, and taxi lights are no longer even there. They're all being embedded into the wing root or the body for as a one single cluster. It's pretty incredible. It's always nice to see an old aircraft getting upgraded with such technology. Great size, looking healthy. Now yeah, we can also inspect the hydraulics from downstairs. There's a variety of ways to inspect hydraulic fluids on any aircraft. You can do it from downstairs, you can do it from upstairs. This is an Airbus family. I can inspect the hydraulics before I even go up to the flight deck. This is also the servicing panel where I can service the hydraulics. It comes with its own hose right there. As I was walking around, I noticed lots of air traffic activity, a helicopter right above my head, which was quite interesting. Most likely doing some kind of a sky tour, which is allowed by ATC through LAX operations. But on top of that, I got to see a beautiful jetliner whizzing across the sky, leaving behind the contrails. And if anybody says chemtrails, ugh, please, it doesn't exist. Stop saying chemtrails, no such thing. Somebody asked me one time what this is. This is actually a super important component. This is called a flugum binder. It takes all the aerodynamic components of the aircraft and this is what actually makes the aircraft fly. I'm just messing around guys. It's literally just a water deflector. That's all it is. How'd you go in there for a second, didn't I? It keeps the water from going inside the cabin when the door is open. I'm sorry, I had to do it. I apologize for the dad jokes. I can't help myself sometime. It's a rain gutter, guys. That's all it is. It's a rain gutter. <laughs> Simple design. When the water comes down, it doesn't fall inside the cabin. It rolls off the airplane. Simple. What a beautiful day. Another fine machine. All is good to go. She's ready to go. Status normal. That's exactly what I want. Alrighty, on to the next one. Next office. I thought this thing was gonna need oil, but not at all. This thing is filled to the brim. Look at that. Woo. They must have oiled it in a previous station. It's all good though. Go check it out. Ah, since we're here, you know, let's check out the master chip detector. Right here. That's the master chip detector. Basically, it's got like a little magnetic tip to it, and it goes through this filter housing right here. And in case there's any kind of medical par metal particles within the engine, it will collect. Not only the, the filter will, will filter it out, but we can inspect the master chip detector to see if there's any metal particles are floating around. So in case we need to do a filter change or if something's, you know, degradating. Oh, down there, that thing is the FMU, the fuel metering unit on the V2500 engine. Oh my goodness, that thing is a, uh, is a challenge to change. Fun. Oh yeah, there you go. By the way, there's not only one of them, there's a bunch of them on this engine. There's a lot more down there. If I remember correctly, on this particular engine, uh, I believe it's- A quick correction, a master chip detector, number one. Number two, one, two, and three bearing chip detector. Number three, number five bearing chip detector. Number four, right-hand gearbox scavenge. Number five, angle gearbox. Number six, left-hand gearbox scavenge. And number seven, the oiler and number four bearing chip detector. There you go, now, seven chip detectors. We are done with this day. Let's get on to the next day. On to the next adventure. Let's go. Good morning, everybody. Another beautiful day. Let's go. That's going to be a beautiful sunrise. Here comes the first office. Coming up from the hangar, 
do a quick little double check, make sure everything's A-OK. -okay. All right, back to the V2500 engine. What else can I tell you about this thing? I think I've talked about this. See this little vent with this little hole inside here? That is an exhaust port for the engine anti-ice. So when this nose cowling gets all nice and warm and needs a place to escape, that's where it escapes. It's an exhaust port, that's about it. Let's see now. This thing right here, that is your ACOC, air-cooled oil cooler. If you look real close inside, you'll see a little radiator fins right there. And back behind this panel, that is your starter valve. This is how you would do a manual start. Here, let's check it out. Looks just like that. See? Put your 3 8 inch drive in there, turn it, and you get your manual start. I made a video about this a while back, showing myself doing a manual engine start on a CFM Leap 1A engine, and everybody in the comments jumped into it. Oh, this is how you hand crank an engine. No, that's not exactly how it works, guys. There's still somebody in the flight deck that is controlling the engine. All I'm doing is opening up a valve because that particular valve is malfunctioning, which is okay, it's not a big deal. There's also another question that always gets asked. Well, if that valve is malfunctioning, how can you restart an engine mid-flight? The engine is already spinning in mid-flight. So it's spinning, that means it's got enough airflow that can restart in flight, just to give you clarification. Go ahead and check out that video I'm talking about. You'll see what I'm talking about. There's a de-oiler right there as well. Pretty cool. Look, we got two more new hires. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Look, if you're going to walk around, come help me out, yeah? You want a cup of coffee? Get out of here. Shh. 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 Go, go. Get away from the airplane. Uh, this darn thing is going to get sucked up by the expensive blender. Encountering wildlife is a normal part of aviation. Birds are not the only problems. There's also lots of living creatures that are on the runways. You have foxes, you have rabbits, wolves, you name it, they got it. Hawks, eagles, pigeons, you name it. There are some deterrents that can keep these animals away, but you know what? Nature will always want to be wherever it wants to be. We try to mitigate this, but you know, at the end of the day, sometimes it's, you, you can't help it. it Machines usually run into wildlife. That's the way it works. I'm sorry. I, this, I'm not in charge of that. Animals will do what they want to do, and machines will have to be where they have to be. That's not supposed to be like that. <laughs> What's wrong with it? Somebody decided to pull a little too hard. It's all right, we got the parts, it's on its way. <laughs> Just held down by three screws. But here's a good look at how the overbed, overhead bins look. They're all composite, honeycomb. Believe it or not, most of your sidewalls, overhead, even the floor you walk on are this material. It's honeycomb composite material. It might look fragile, but it's not. It's actually very strong. Regardless of that, we're trying to fix an overhead bin latch. This was quite interesting. Sometimes passengers uh, get a little bit overzealous and they pull on the handle a little bit too hard and they forget it's just plastic. And uh, it's okay, no problem. It's the easy fix. We have it. A lot of people always ask, where do I get my parts? How do I get my parts? We have a storage department on field. We have one on station for the terminal. We also have a massive storage department at our hangar. Pretty much most airlines run like this. All I have to do is get the part number, requisition the part, 
and either I go pick it up myself or I can have it delivered if I need to expedite. Most of the time on the line, obviously it's expedite because we are in a hurry because we need to turn the aircraft around quickly. This is one of the most common items, which is there's a overhead baggage bin handle. So we had the part ready immediately. I got this part within, I say, 10 minutes. A simple installation process. Three screws and it was in, that's it. Just to note, meanwhile I'm doing this, catering is doing their job, cleaners are doing their job. It's a continuous operation, nobody stops. I am constantly moving out of other people's way so they can do their jobs as well. But a quick little operational check, and yep, works as advertised. Beautiful. Let's go. You are not gonna believe how much this thing costs. This little handle. This thing almost 300 bucks. A little over 300 bucks actually. It's insane. Jeez. Anyway, I'll give this back to stores. Let them do whatever they wanna do with it. All right, back inside another Airbus. Coming slowly to the end. You know, one interesting thing I realized that I always show you guys the stick shakers on the Boeing. And you get to hear on the 737, other airplanes too, a stall warning test. Obviously there's a yoke and column, but this is Airbus. No yoke, no column, nothing to shake. It's got a side stick, but it's got an oral warning. Let's listen to it. It's really loud too. For this, you gotta go into the ADR system and you gotta go here. And you gotta test the AOAs. Get ready, it's gonna get loud. Stall, 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 stall. Nothing shaking. On Airbus, it's just a oral warning. You're, this is annoying. <laughs> and that's it. That's your uh, stall warning test on the Airbus. See? Okay, a final walk through the cabin, make sure everything is A-OK. -okay. Let's see now. I've told you what the triangles are for. I'm not gonna tell you again. <laughs> I think I've talked about that one to death. Oh, let's take a look outside. It's pretty. Oh, you know what? Here, I think I think I have said this to you. Okay, when you're flying airplanes and sometimes you see a little tab right there on the wing, I believe I've said this to you before, what this for is. Well, it's in your safety card too. That's why I say read your safety card. It's for a rope. And that's right. It's for a rope and it's right over your head. Right there. It's called a lifeline. Basically, when you're evacuating in an emergency, obviously you follow instructions, that's like it says, and then you take the handy dandy rope, you attach it right there, and then attach it out to the wing right there and you crawl out or hold on so you don't fall off that's what it's there for anyway it's in your safety card just fyi anyway read your safety card it's important well what else can i say i hope you all have been enjoying these little adventures and uh, these journeys through aircraft maintenance and aviation in general i'm happy i can show you what I do and what aircraft maintenance does for a living and how we keep you safe. We go from the very minute to the very important. I always tell you, we are very much the ghosts of the industry. Nobody really sees us. Nobody really knows about us. But next time you fly, thank the passenger that is next to you that is courteous. You have a good travel buddy. And as you're getting off the airplane, thank the flight attendants for keeping you comfortable and keeping you safe. And as you're walking out, Give a big thank you to the captain and the pilots that have been giving you safe flight and passage through the beautiful skies. Give thanks to the ramp agents, to the ticket agents, and everybody else in between that have been servicing you and making sure that you are getting to your destination. And last but not least, turn around and say, hey, you know, I might not see this person, I might never get to talk to them, but say thank you to the aircraft mechanic that worked this airplane. 
trust me, it will mean a lot to us. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for being here and participating in this adventure. This would not have been possible without you. I'll see you guys on the next adventure. Take care.